Good morning or good afternoon or good evening to everyone, depending on where you are. My name is Marco Minghini. Uh, I'm from Italy. Uh, I have the pleasure to chair this uh, uh, session for the academic track. We will have a lot of exciting talks and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the first uh, speakers. And the speakers are Santiago Seppi and Andres Solarte. Um, they both work at the uh, Gulich Institute of the Argentinian Space uh, Agency and their field of expertise is SAR remote sensing and especially SAR uh, interferometry and polarimetric SAR interferometry. They will give uh, a talk that is uh, titled on the feasibility of applying orbital corrections to uh, TOLCOM 1 data with free open source software to generate digital surface models, a case study in Argentina. So the floor is yours and you have 20 minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Marco. Well, good afternoon, everybody. So as Marco has introduced, we are going to show today an implementation we made on Python of an orbital correction methodology that was developed 10 years ago by Antonio Pepe and collaborators. We are only, the, uh, the other goal is also to evaluate the effects of this orbital correction with field measurements we were able to, to get of a mm -hmm. study area. And finally, we will discuss a small discussion, hold a small discussion about how the model parameters can affect the results of the correction. So now I will leave the floor to my colleague Andres, who is going to give some theoretical and methodological introductions. Hello, everybody. Well, as Santiago said, we are going to talk about some issues that we have when we work with SER images for inter interparametric purposes. But first, when we speak about azimuth, we will refer to the direction of the satellite's uh, trajectory while uh, when uh, well, yeah, the satellite trajectory. When, when we speak about range, is the direction in which the satellite is looking at the Earth uh, at some target. Yes. Let's think first in range direction. In some techniques, exploit the phase difference between two acquisitions with slightly different geometry. Just make heights or displacement or the surface. But for this, we need to know with high accuracy their positions in each moment. Since errors in the orbit data lead to errors in our estimation. Okay. With those positions, we estimate something called baseline, that is the distance between the two satellites, here called M and S, for master and slave. Yes. That baseline can be decomposed in perpendicular baseline, that is the blue line, and parallel baseline, that is the green one. Yes. The phase, let's say, uh, is one minute ago, is, uh, can be represented by this equation. Yes. So we can see that the phase is related to the difference between the distance of, uh, from the satellites to the target uh, multiplied by, uh, by some parameter which depends with the wavelength. Yeah. We can, uh, uh, from that equation, we can uh, see, we can estimate the phase gradient in range direction. Yeah. The, we can see the details of this uh, composition in that paper, the paper at all, 2011. But what is important here is that the, the gradient in the blue square uh, has a term that is related to the topography, it's omega. Omega depends uh, the topography. But even if we have no topography, there is a value that depends uh, uh, on the perpendicular baseline. So in range direction, if I have, or we have a bad estimation of the perpendicular baseline, we will have a gradient. Now, what happened in azimuth direction? Well, 
normally the trajectory of the slides is not parallel, so we have to think about the error that can be introduced by uh, by the simulation and the position while the satellite the satellites are moving. Yes, so here we can see again the same equation uh, we used before, but uh, this time this time we have. Uh, to take into account the, the azimuth coordinate, uh, coordinate. So if we estimate the gradient in azimuth, we can see three terms. The third term is um, depends on the distance from the satellite to the target. If we think about satellite systems, that distance is too long, so that term is small. The middle term is related to the uh, view angle and the tilt angle of the satellite. So, again, for satellite system, this value is uh, too small. And if we have a uh, value estimation in my parallel baseline, that value is most representative in the equation. So the gradient in azimuth direction depends mostly of my of the errors in the parallel baseline. But how can we see this in the image or how it is seen in the image in the images? Well here we can see uh, some simulations in errors in the perpendicular baseline. Here we have the azimuth direction and the orange direction. On the right side, we have an interprogram without errors. And on the left side, we have two inter the same interprogram, but we introduce it to difference in the perpendicular baseline, 10 meters and 5 meters. And we have we can see that the fringes or the grid, we have a gradient in range direction. Now, in azimuth, if we have a, a bad estimation in my parallel baseline, the same, but in this case, we have a, 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 a page gradient in the azimuth direction. Yes, here we can see again two examples of fringes in that direction. And finally, if we have a bad a combination of, of those errors, we can have uh, fringes or ramps in any direction, yes? Yeah. But how can how can we correct these errors? Well, the method proposed by Pepper starts with a range correction by a course estimation of the error in the perpendicular baseline. For this purpose, we made a perturbation the original orbit, introducing a, ne introducing a negative and a positive value to estimate the phase gradients and applying uh, the second method to get an approximation of the truth value. When we have this value, what we do is again, calculate the new orbit, the new orbit parameters, and again, make uh, some perturbation in the orbit to estimate new values and get a refinement of the delta uh, perpendicular baseline delta estimation. So we have a, a value, a new value that is uh, near to the truth uh, delta of my baseline. Once we have this estimation, the perpendicular baseline corrected, we use this value to make the same process and correct the parallel baseline. Yes, this is the same process, but we have as an input the perpendicular baseline. Well, here we can see a diagram showing how the corrector works. In the left side, we have uh, what I mentioned before, this is the, the, the scheme. And in the right side, we have in detail how how each estimation works. We have the orbit perturbation, yes, then we estimate the phase gradient, and with that we 
get a course a baseline delta, and that delta is used to make uh, the refinement of the estimation. Finally, well, when we have corrected the perpendicular and parallel baseline, we uh, what we obtain is a corrected differential interpreter. Okay, so now that Andres has given a small theoretical background on, on the methodology, I am going to introduce you the case study where we decided to apply this orbital correction module. So for this study, we chose an area which is located near a city that is called Concordia in the province of Entre Rios. And in this area, we found three Saucon 1A images Saucon works in Elvan and belongs to the, to the Argentinian Space Agency. And all of these images had the feature of being full polar, polarized, full polarization, four polarizations, which is very useful in terms of forest plantation characterization. So, so this footprint in red shows the approximate extension of the images, of these three Saucon images. And the area in blue is showing the area for which we had some field measurements that were provided by local forest producers. And these darker green polygons are forest plantations for which we got um, height elevation maps with these SACOM images. With the images, we formed three interferometric pairs. So it is very impor important to stress that the correction we make, we make is not performed on the images, but on the interferometric pairs. So the correction is made at this level, not at the level of the image. So what we basically did was to conduct the typical interfer interferometric workflow, processing workflow, but we divided it in two sub-workflows. What we call A here in red refers to the workflow where we uh, plug in the orbital correction module we developed. So after running the orbital correction that Andres explained, we got a corrected interferometric phase. On the other hand, we, we also conducted the interferometric workflow with no correction, which is shown with the letter B in, in blue. I think it's blue in the presentation. Um, from here, we got an, a, phase, a phase map with no correction. So we had, after this procedure, two two height uh, elevation maps, two elevation maps, one with correction and the other one with no correction. So what you can see here is an intermediate output of, of this uh, orbital correction procedure. A shows the differential interferogram with no correction. So you can see here that it has a mixture of azimuth and perpendicular errors because there is a, a fringe, an orbital ramp that has more or less in this direction. And B shows the result of removing these this orbital ramps with the orbital correction module. In fact, in reality, we work with the topographic in the affairs. These are the without correction and the corrected one. But I show the differential ones because when we work with, with topographic interferons, the topographic fringes are very dominant, so it's not possible to realize visually that there is an orbital ramp, as you can see it more easily here in the differential. So C was the output of this workflow B, and D was the output of, of this workflow A. Here I show the results of the phase elevation, the height elevation maps of one of the pairs. Here you can see a an RGB composite of a sentient to image. So just to let you know where the forest plantations are that are highlighted in green and dark green. The red dots are the points for which we were provided with field measurements. And B shows the resultant digital elevation model with no orbital correction. C shows, on the other hand, the resulting of the, of the elevations after applying the orbital correction. So what you can see here, already from a visual point of view, is that applying the, the orbital correction has a positive impact because the, the forests are more distinguishable from the flat surroundings. And this 
uh, luckily we had field measurements so we could uh, make a quantitative assessment of this improvement and um, we computed the root mean square error of the heights versus the uh, estimated so in the case of the orbital corrective which is the last column we got much better results so up to now everything seems to be like a very nice fairy tale everything went well, went well and we had a happy ending however um, we need to discuss about a number of parameters we use when applying the orbital correction and one of them is the interferometric coherence threshold used to filter out the points to calculate the first gradient. The interferometric phase uh, coherence, the interferometric coherence, is an indirect measurement of the phase quality. So what we did, what is desirable is to have very good points, very good phase quality points to correctly estimate the phase gradient and conduct successfully the, the orbital correction process. The problem is that the coherence is very polarization dependent. For example, here for the same pair, we can see that the, the coherence in HH channel is much higher than in HP channel, in a copolarized versus a cross polarized channel. And this has an impact. So it is not indifferent to use one on another gamma threshold to filter out the points uh, depending on the polarization. You can see it, for example, in this slide, it will be more clear. This is very similar to what Andres showed show, uh, before, but this is plotted with actually real data we work with. This is for uh, one of the pairs, interferometric pairs we processed. You can see here that given this gamma threshold, 0 0.25, the, the estimations of the perpendicular basin, in this case, of the delta perpendicular basins, are different between the HB channel in blue and the HH channel in red. And this is a problem because, for example, with this value of delta baseline, in the case of HB channel, we not only do not achieve the orbital correction, but even it gets worse. So B, we have introduced an orbital ramp. So we didn't solve anything. Then when trying another value, for example, like using a lower gamma threshold, the results of the delta estimation, of the delta baseline estimation seem to converge to the same value. And here we see that we achieve the, the correction by using this gamma threshold. But this leaves us a bigger problem because it is very difficult to realize which are the best combination of, of parameters we have to use or what is the way, way of estimating the parameters we need to use for this model. Here this slide tries to sum up uh, some of the many tests we, com we conducted, like combining different combinations of multi-locking factor and gamma threshold. So although here you might, you might say that using uh, a high gamma threshold, you will get better results in terms of the root mean square error. The problem is that using very, very high gamma thresholds, very threshold in interferometric coherence may leave out uh, too many points and work with too few, too few points to estimate the phase gradient. So if we have very few points for a phase gradient, maybe the correction is not feasible. So our learning from this has, is that there's still not a golden rule or an ideal combination in terms of the parameters uh, that these models need to, to, as an input, to run correctly. So to sum up and now to run off the time, in this work, we could find, find out that it is possible to implement the orbital correction methodology that was developed by, by Antonio Pepe with, with free open so, 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 software with Python with Saucon 1A interferometric data. We were able in this case to reduce the absolute error in the estimation of the heights, but we still need to discuss about which are the ideal combination of parameters for, for this model, or how to estimate them correctly in terms of the polarization channel we want to correct. In the meanwhile, we need to provide the users of this module with flexibility of setting the parameters and be very conscious of on the impact they have on the orbital correction. One possible approach is to estimate the orbital ramp or the orbital correction 
uh, only for the most coherent channel because the orbital correction is something that should affect all the polarization channels of a pair in the same way. So maybe one estimates in the delta basins for the HA channel and then we simply apply it to the same of the channels without having different estimations of the orbital round. So finally, and before finishing, we would like to make some, some acknowledgements. In first, to Forestal Argentina, Vega, Maita, and Bomar S.A., which are forest, local forest producers, because they provided us, provided us with field measurements of height, of three heights, and we were able to compute the, the root mean square error. Then, of course, to CONAI, which is Argentinian Space Agency, because they provided us with the SAOCON 1A images. And finally, to Antonio Pepe and his collaborators, who are the ones who gave origin to the methodology we implemented in Python in this work. So, thank you very much for your time. Here I leave my, my contact information and Andres too. And in case you have any questions, we are open to them. Thanks a lot, Santiago and Andres, for a very comprehensive presentation. I'm not an expert of SAR uh, image processing, but I have to say I found your uh, explanation, including the, uh, the, the the initial background, very uh, clear and very exhaustive uh, to follow. So thanks a lot for that. We have uh, a question um, from the audience. Um, the question is, some of the uh, interferometric pairs that you used have a lot of days of separation between acquisitions. Does, the, does that affect the accuracy uh, of the dam? Yes, yes, it affects directly, especially the temporal correlation. Uh, uh, the, idea, the idea would be to have uh, the minimum possible separation in, in days, but in this case, this was what was available. The ideal thing would be to have the, the the nominal revisit time of SAOCON, which is uh, 16 days. But this was what we had in this case. OK, thanks. Um, I'll wait for some more questions uh, to appear in the question tab. So that's, uh, uh, again, a request to the audience to please add questions if you have any. In the meantime, I, I can ask one uh, myself. Um, so I understand you basically um, uh, tested the, the, the procedure on an area with a specific image and a specific uh, um, uh, area with, with its uh, um, uh, topography and characteristics. But can you elaborate a bit more whether and uh, how much uh, the, the procedure and the results, for example, in terms of expected uh, uh, RMSC uh, can be extended to other uh, areas, uh, especially given the uh, difficulty that you uh, discussed in the estimation of the, of the parameters? Well, I consider, uh, I don't know what do you think, Andres, but uh, I think it's something very extensible to other, other areas. I work a lot with this module uh, in my PhD thesis. I have to, uh, the SACOM images lack a lot of suffer a lot from orbital errors, so they need to be compensated for. Uh, I've been able to correct, to compensate for the runs. The problem is I don't have the quality or the quantity of field that data I had in this study. So it's not so easy to me to make a quantitative assessment. But in terms of the visual effect, it does have a, a very effective result. I don't know, Andres, if you can use it. In there, is a, there is a process that can be extended not only for them, but also for a differential parameter. A method that makes a correction in the parameters from the inside geometry, and you can use it in other areas and other uh, techniques that we use uh, inside. So, uh, the thing that you have to, to keep in mind that you need some values to to assess the, the error and see what you are getting is uh, in, uh, accurate. Uh, for your purposes, your, your work. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, we still have time if uh, questions uh, appear in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to remember to everyone that uh, there is also a paper that is published associated to this talk. All the papers of the academic track uh, from Phosphor G 2021 are already published on the ISPRS uh, archive. So you can also check the full paper uh, where basically you will find the uh, 
clearly more more structured information about this uh, research with all uh, details and all references that you uh, need if you want to understand more. Okay, uh, I don't see uh, additional questions in the chat, so I think we can close here. I would like to thank uh, uh, once more uh, Santiago and Andres for the great uh, presentation uh, and to the audience, if you liked it, please uh, uh, put your hands together with a virtual applause in the, in the, in the venue list. Thanks a lot and I wish you a good uh, uh, continuation of Ospergy 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Marco.